بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا ونبينا وعظيمنا وحبيبنا رسول الله محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الأطهار الأطيبين لا سيما سيدنا ومولانا بقية الله في الأرضين قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين وعاد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعاشرهن بالمعروف فإن كرهتمون فعسى أن تكرهوا شيئا ويجعل الله فيه خيرا كثيرا As we gather this evening Millions upon millions of people around the world are suffering from domestic violence. As we gather this evening, millions upon millions of people are injured and hospitalized due to severe violence that takes place at home. In this country, in the United Kingdom alone, three million people report domestic abuse every single year. In the United States of America, Every 24 seconds on average, a person is a victim of domestic abuse. A staggering number of 12 million individuals in America alone report domestic abuse every single year. As we speak and gather this evening, more than 500 million children will not enjoy a night's sleep because they'll be exposed to domestic violence. Many people, every single night, every day of their lives, They have to use drugs and alcohol to escape this bitter reality. Brothers, sisters, friends, beloveds, have you ever came across a homeless woman? Have you ever wondered what her story could be? Have you ever come across a young teen that's addicted to drugs, but sleeping on the side of a street and asked yourself, what could this young man's story be? What drove him out of his home? Where is his family? Have you ever asked yourself, what is it that has gone wrong within the lives of children and teenagers, 
to have to end up in juvenile prisons. We come across stories of young men, young women, who will have to spend half of their lives, most of their lives, in prison because of a mistake they did in their early days, in their youth. We come across women who have run away from their homes because anywhere outside those four walls was more pleasant for them. We come across children, youth, young adults who are in a self-destructive mode ready to take their own lives, contemplating suicide every single day. Have you ever wondered why a father would be under so much immense pressure that he'd be willing to take his own life? We see those individuals. Sometimes we see them in the streets. Sometimes we encounter them in public places. Sometimes we hear about them in newspapers. But mostly, we look at them in an extremely degrading and belittling manner. They should know better. Why did he commit the crime? Why is she addicted to drugs? Why is she an alcoholic? She deserves this life. This person that's going through those miseries, it's her fault. She ran away from home. We don't ever pause and think, could this ever be me? Could this ever happen to me? Could this happen to my own child? Could this homeless girl that's sleeping out in the rain and the cold on the side of the street be my own sister and my sibling? We don't. For the most part, we have no sympathy with such individuals. Have you ever taken a moment to speak with them? To see what their story is like? Some of them were successful individuals, bright men and women. Some of them are beautiful children. Some of them are enthusiastic young men and women who have to spend the rest of their lives behind bars in prison. Though such stories are foreign to our families, to our communities, But the rising number of individuals who are running away from, the, from their homes, who are abandoning their families, the rising number of our sisters, our mothers, our daughters having to spend the night at a woman's shelter is on the rise. And the numbers are alarming. They're extremely disturbing. While the majority of our manabir, our Islamic centers, our institutions, our ulama, our khutaba, Allocate their time to speak of ibadat. How to perform wudu. How to perform ghusl. What to do if we made a mistake between the second and the third rak'ah. To speak of Islamic history. 
We, has, we have to ask ourselves. We have to ask ourselves what our priorities are. This member shapes the future of Islam. This member shapes the future of our families. This member has a responsibility. And inshallah, I will get to that. But I want to tell you something, brothers, sisters. If somebody is mentally incapable to focus on life, if somebody is incapable from the smallest, incapable to see the blessings of their lives, whether they're small or big, a lecture about Islamic law or Islamic history would be meaningless for them. This heart has to be ready. This mind has to be ready. And in order for us to do that, we have to prioritize what should be stated, mentioned, and taught from this member. While we speak of those ibadat, while we speak of Islamic history, which is important, many individuals and our community are disheartened with the Islamic institution. Many people will actually never step foot into a masjid, into a Husayniya. I personally saw individuals, some individuals, who joined the burning Qur'an session because they saw that the Qur'an is the reason behind their miseries. Muslims, something is, something's got to wake us up. And for the most part, we ignore the most important topics. And tonight, I have chosen to speak of this crucial, very important discussion, domestic violence, that's on the rise, that has always existed within our communities and our families. And we have not discussed it, and we have shied away from it. And we have always ignored the elephant in the room. Tonight, I want to be the voice of those who were never given a voice. Tonight, I want to tell you the story of the Madlumin and our families and our community. Tonight, I want to do justice to the member of Imam al Hussein. That is meant to inspire those who are weak, who have seen injustice, who don't know where to go and who to seek refuge in. Those who are abused at home, but they have to suck it up, they have to be quiet. They cannot speak to anybody. They cannot complain to anybody. Because of the shame. Because of the guilt. Because they remain misunderstood. Tonight is their night. And my voice this evening is their voice. I want to discuss this topic in the following manner. Number one. The responsibility of the religious institution when it comes to domestic violence. Number two, I will share with you the three shocking stories. 
Number three, the effects of domestic violence on children. And number four, the Islamic legal perspective on domestic violence after your three loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Brothers, sisters, there are many individuals, thousands of people in our community that have to deal with this drama every single day, every single night. And when they Resort to the Islamic institutions, the scholars, the leadership. They don't find help. They're ignored. They're driven away and sometimes they're even disrespected. They've lost hope. And if we don't save them, We may putting them at risk of walking away from the religion of Islam. And that will be on us. It's our responsibility. Therefore, I believe the Islamic institution, the ulama, the khutaba, the organizers, the majalis have the following three responsibilities. Number one, to adopt the methodology of the Holy Quran. What do I mean? The Quran has more than 6,000 ayat, more than 6,000 verses. Two hundred to five hundred of those verses, depending on different opinions of scholars, pertain to law. Islamic legal theory, Islamic legal system. The rest of the Quran is a book of morality. The rest of the Quran is a book of akhlaq. The rest of the Quran is a book of humanity. To make us true insan. The rest of the Quran speaks of family values. Respect and kindness amongst family members. Respect and kindness towards our parents, our children, our neighbors, our friends, other minorities, other religious groups. The Quran is a book. That is meant to train the Muslim community to have the utmost levels of morality and ethics. And the Quran says, وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ And you must seek the example of Rasulullah in your life. Rasulullah, who is praised by the Almighty God to have the greatest of akhlaq, innaka ala khuluqin azim. What has gone wrong then when we see this staggering, astonishing, and disturbing decline in morality and akhlaq? Allah has given us this body. And those muscles and those hands, so that we can work, we can strive to bring halal rizq and put it on the table and supporting 
our spouse, our parents, and our children. Not the other way around. Not to become a wolf. Not to turn their lives into a nightmare. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants there to be love amongst family members. Compassion amongst family members. Therefore, if you look at the Qur'an, you will find that the Qur'an focuses on akhlaq. We have to focus on akhlaq and our majalis and our gatherings and our sermons as much as the Qur'an does. Number two, it is the responsibility of the religious institution to listen. We don't listen. We don't listen to the people. We demand attention. We want people to listen to us. We need you to pay attention to us. But we are not willing to listen to you. And this is just not going to work anymore. We need to listen to the people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam would sit in the masjid and he would listen to the people. Every single person was able to meet the highest authority in Islam. Speak to him directly. A woman had a disagreement with her husband at home 1,400 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula in Mecca in the middle of a desert. So she then wanted to leave the house and her husband says, where the hell are you going? What do you think you're doing? She says, I'm going to go and complain to the Prophet. Says, you think the Prophet is going to listen to you? You're a woman. He's going to pay attention to you? He's going to believe you? Nobody believes woman. She went. She met with Rasulullah. She whispered her problem to the Prophet. Thinking that it's only her and the Prophet who are part of this conversation. After the conver conversation ended, Rasulullah says to her, Ya Amatullah, listen. There was a third person listening to this conversation. And he has made This conversation public to the entire world for generations to come. He has recorded this conversation. And the last revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a witness. Allah listened. And Allah has revealed an entire chapter to discuss your remorse. لَقَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ She complained to Allah. Allah listened to her complaint. Let us listen to the people. Let us not ignore them. Let us not judge them. I said this and I will say it again. People who are not here. People who are not part of our communities. They don't gather in the four walls of our Masajid al Husayniyat. are as important as those within our Husayniyat, within our Masajid, within our Islamic institutions. Let us care for them. Let us find them. Let us hear them. And number three, let us be fair. Let us be fair. To all the leaders, to all the imams, 
to all those in leadership position, if a man and woman come to you in counseling to seek advice, to seek help, be fair to both of them. And you know exactly what I mean. Listen to both of them. Honor both of them. Allah belongs to both of them. Allah created both of them. Allah loves us all equally. Don't say he is my, my friend's son. He's a generous member in our community. Shall I say more? He's a personal friend of mine. Before the session begins, you've already judge, made a judgment against this innocent woman. You will not listen to her. Once I met with two individuals, a couple, who were actually my friends. They said, we were shy to meet with you. We wanted to meet with others. But after the session, the sister told me, Sayyid, this is the third session I have met with scholars, with religious leaders. They would not even listen to me, nor look at me, nor give me attention. One of them kicked me out of his office because he said, you don't have good hijab. Don't come to meet, meet with me because you don't have good hijab. To such ulama, to such leaders, may Allah forgive you. Read the Quran. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah demands that you establish adl and justice, kindness, and you are fair. You have an amana. This amana is the Quran. This aman is the knowledge of the Ahl al-Bayt. Allah says that we must deliver the amana in the best of ways. وَأَدُّ الْأَمَانَاتَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا If this person leaves disheartened with you, with your treatment, they may leave and never come back towards the Islamic institution and that will be on us with that said brothers sisters parents those who want to get married those who are married I'm going to share with you three stories only three Though I may be able to share with you tens of hundreds of stories tonight, I'm just going to share three stories with you. Those stories, you may listen to them and hear them and, and think this sounds so familiar. I feel like I know this person. And the reason is because we've heard them so many times in different shapes and different forms from different individuals. But yet we have not been able to fix the problem. The first story is a story of a woman who found her way to the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. Salawatullahi alayhim. Obviously, it's a struggle. You have to research. You have to read. You have to convince yourself that what I knew all those years was different from the truth that I see today. People who had never heard of the story of Imam al Hussein, who had never heard of the event of Mubahala, who had never heard of the event of Ghadir. And she found herself accepting of the madhab of Al-Muhammad. 
Of course, you know such individuals will go through scrutiny, hardship, difficulty within their families. It's not easy. You wake up one day and you tell your parents, well, I'm going to be different. I'm going to change my religion. I'm going to change my school of thought. How will they react? Obviously, for the most part, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. So imagine what this person had to deal with at home. Then she marries a person that adheres to the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. And you would think that now life is going to be beautiful. Now, this person is going to treat me like Imam Hussein, like Imam Hassan, like Imam Ali. Well, obviously we can't. We are not ma'soom. We all make mistakes. We all get angry. We all get upset. We're human beings and it's normal. But what is not normal is the extent of the physical abuse on daily basis. Where this person is bruised from head to toes, crying from pain to sleep every night. That's not normal. That's not okay. Those stories long, one of the most disturbing parts of the story is that after this woman gives birth to a small child, one day she comes home to see all her belongings out on the street, away from her family, a person who's alone. A kid crying inside the house, but she can't get in. Her life is paraded on the side of the street. Her clothes, her belonging. What can we say to this? And the worst part is that it is the mother of the husband who did this. The mother. I don't care what the crime of this person was. I don't need to know the crime of this person. Whatever the crime could have been, however much you hated this person, does not justify this. A person that cannot go back to her family and say the followers of Ahl al-Bayt did this to me. A person who is mazloom. A person who has no voice. Who cannot be heard. Do we not know that one day they will put us in our grave? Do we not think that we have sisters and we have children? And we have daughters? Would we allow this to happen to them? Regardless if they had committed even a crime or a mistake, would we allow this? What kind of human beings are we? You know, sometimes we see what's happening in Yemen. Sometimes we see people selling drugs. Sometimes we, pe we see people manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. And we ask ourselves, what the hell are those individuals? How can you just... Throw a bomb at some people and just kill hundreds of them, thousands of them. How can you invade them? How can you sell drugs to innocent kids? Well, look at us. Our domain is our family. And look at how we treat our own family. This is not our enemy. This is my own wife, my own husband, my own child. How can you tolerate this child crying for their mom in that moment? The second story, and I have chosen different ones because I believe every one of them represents a wave of emails, a wave of stories, a wave of individuals that have reached out to me throughout the years. A person who... Again, 
It starts with insults, then it leads to physical abuse, then it leads to violence, dangerous violence, where people are scared for their lives, where people have to go and lock themselves into a bathroom or a closet because they fear that they're going to be killed. And you allow this person to go on because you want to protect your family, your children. But this person, this wild beast, I shall say, does not stop there. Out of rage, out of anger, resorts to exposing or I shall say accusing this person by taking her phone and sending random messages to different people, making a Facebook post, going on her Instagram, calling her names, accusing her of different things, shattering her reputation, not just in her city, globally, around the world. Because we know Facebook is not just something that we have you know, within our local family and friends, but no, we, we potentially could be Reach to the entire world. Shaming someone to the entire world. Destroying them. Literally destroying them. Not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. Well, some people might say, well, Sayyid, how do you know this person is? I don't know. But I do know the Quranic protocol. The Quran says if you don't have four witnesses to that specific act, then you must be quiet. It's not your business to speak. In fact, the person who assumes and speaks, the Quran says is mal'oon. Assumes and speaks. The business of exposing people. The business of shattering their reputation. This has become a game in our community. It's become so easy for people. And we're okay with this. And while these people, those individuals, and the likes of those individuals carry on with such activity, people will see them in the street. People will see them in the market. People will see them at different places. They'll greet them. They'll hang out with them. They'll speak to them. They'll respond to them. They'll engage with them. Is this not true? Is this not the case? Of people in our society. And when you say, why? Why would you do something like this? Well, they haven't really hurt me. I don't really know them. What do I know? The third story. You have to move on, unfortunately. The third story is of an individual... Who was beaten, harassed to an extent that she visited the hospital 17 times during her marriage because of broken body parts. Every night, when her husband would arrive home, instead of welcoming him at the door, she would hide in a closet and lock the door. And I have to say this here specifically, when this person seek counseling with a local Islamic center, she was kicked out of the counseling because she was rude. I, 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 I don't know if you've gone so much trouble if you've seen so much pain, if you've seen so much agony, if you're bleeding from the outside and the inside, I don't know anybody who can control their anger at that point, who would be reasonable, who would not be rude. Do we not give such people the benefit of the doubt? Should we not be more understanding? Should we not be more caring to them? Those stories, those three stories that I have shared with you, my respected brothers and sisters, 
should wake us up. And I'm sure they're not new to us. And I'm sure you've heard similar stories. But what we need now is to do things differently. Before your child gets married, you must seek counseling before marriage and not just during marriage. Who is this person? Are they compatible? Why are they getting married? And inshallah, we will speak of the agony of single parents. <clears throat> and I will speak not only tomorrow, not only <clears throat> after their divorce, <clears throat> but in the process of separation, because that's when a person becomes a single parent. That's when two families are shattered. A family is shattered to two. That's when homes are broken. And we'll talk about the agony of an individual that's trying to get a divorce in our community. That will, well, that will come tomorrow. But what I want to say is, know what you're getting your son and your daughter into prior to this marriage. And by the way, many people might be listening and saying, well, Sayyid, all those stories pertain to women. In fact, studies indicate that 30% of domestic violence is against men. So if there is 1 million cases, 300,000 of them are men. So in the United Kingdom alone, nearly 1 million men are subject to domestic abuse. Some of them are stabbed to death by their own wives. I'm not taking sides. They both need a place of safety. They both need to be heard and their problems must be addressed. And I'll add this, our centers and our institutions must represent Baytullah al-Haram. Because Allah says this is the, the greatest masjid, the most honorable masjid, this is your qibla. Why is it our qibla? Have you ever thought, why is masjid al-Haram our qibla? Is it just a direction that we pray towards? No. Masjid al-Haram is our qibla. Because the story of Masjid al-Haram, we must remind ourselves of the story of Masjid al-Haram every day. The laws of Masjid al-Haram every day. What must take place in Masjid al-Haram every day. Where we do not hurt people, where we do not judge people. With everybody who enters Masjid al-Haram enjoys peace and tranquility. وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ Amina, whoever enters the masjid is amin, must be safe. Only physically? No. Mentally as well. If people come to our institutions, they must feel safety. How many of you have heard of stories of people going to their local Islamic centers, speaking of their problems, and next thing you know, it's all over the community. Everybody's talking about it. It's the talk of town. Number three, the effects of domestic abuse, domestic violence on children. Before we engage in that, please recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To a child. His parents are the world. His parents represent his universe. If they're in harmony and peace and love, then the world is beautiful to this child. But if there is war within the family, there is violence within the family, this child will suffer will suffer from anxiety and child depression. Go and look up the symptoms, the causes of child depression. Children who are depressed, chronically depressed, who will suffer for their entire life, who will never feel the satisfaction of life within who will always remember the 
flashbacks of the violence that took place at home. In the beginning of the lecture, I told you 500 million kids suffer from this every single day, every single night, where they cannot sleep the night. I remember somebody once told me that she was responsible to take her siblings who were younger than her at the age seven. Then you have a five-year-old and you have a three-year-old. She was responsible to take them into the closet and lock the door while there was violence happening in their home. The reason why we have long pauses in the lecture today, and you know I, I'm not one that pauses so much, it's we have to really just fathom all of this. It's too much. It's, real, it's too much. What we're doing to our children and our families and their future. So now let me connect you back to the beginning of the lecture. When you see that homeless guy, when you see that homeless woman, when you see people on drugs, when you see people running away from their homes, there is a story behind it. It's one of those stories. If you've been through this and you've come out different, you're a strong person. May Allah bless you. You are a hero. You are a walking hero. You're a legend. And it's the strength of Allah and your iman and your taqwa that's kept you going. I wanted to speak so much about the Islamic legal perspective on domestic violence. Fortunately, our time's up. But I'll say this. If you hurt anybody in Islam, even jokingly, and they, their skin color changes, you ought to pay them a penalty. So if it turns red, you pay. If it turns green, you pay. If it turns black, you pay. Now imagine how much some of us are ought to pay. You don't pay that, Allah is going to hold you responsible in the day of judgment. You know in what way? The tradition tells us. And a day of judgment, if you believe in the day of judgment, where everybody is looking for safety, where nobody wants to feel afraid, those individuals on that day will fear. Those individuals on that day will be overtaken by fear. They will be afraid. Why? Because that's all they did. They terrorized the hearts of the closest people to them. You know the Kaaba, the Holy Kaaba, is the most honorable place to us Muslims. It is the direction of our prayers. It is the most honorable sacred home of God. One day the Prophet Muhammad, our Prophet, the Prophet who taught us morality and ethics, the Prophet that taught us compassion, one day tells his companions, how dignified and honorable is this Kaaba, the house of God? So they said, indeed, O the Messenger of God, it is of honor. He said, a believing man and woman is more honorable to God than this cubic house, than those stones. And if you hurt a human that has no ability to defend themselves. Listen to this. Take this with you home. Make this the message for this evening. Spread this to others. Teach this to your children. 
somebody asks Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he says to him, Yabda Rasulullah, what is the distance between the earth and the seventh heaven? He said, the distance is the dua of a mazloom. The cries of somebody who is oppressed. The cries of the oppressed will go to the seventh heaven, to the throne of God so fast. And it will shake the throne of God, of God like no other sin. Those who cry at night, not having anybody to listen to them, Allah listens to them. Allah is there to assist them and to aid them. And this is the spirit of the majlis of Imam Al-Hussein. To stand with the weak, to stand with the mazloom. To teach ourselves and our children that we must not be the zalim, but we must be the mazloom. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen says to his sons, Hassan and Hussein, Bunayya, Bunayya Hassan, Bunayya Hussein, La takun للظالمي عونا do not be an aid to the ظالم and be a nasir be an aid to the mظلوم always stand with the weak with those who are facing injustice and the first person to ever stand for the cause of the mظلوم that we gather here for this evening was no other than his cousin, the alim, the faqih, Muslim, Muslim ibn Aqil, Safir al Hussein, the ambassador of Hussein. Tonight we honor him. Tonight we remember him. The first shaheed in the camp of Hussein ibn Ali. Imam Hussein cried for him. Ahl al Bayt cried for him when the news of Aqil reached Imam al Hussein. Why? Is it because he was the cousin of Hussein? No. Because Aqil, because Muslim, the son of Aqil, taught us that we could never. Ever go against our principles. Treachery is not of our nature. He was there in Kufa. He was in the house when Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad came. They allowed him to leave the room and to end Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He knew that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is going to cause a calamity and kill so many people. You all know the story, he never got out, he never stabbed him from the back. They told him, Muslim, what happened to you? We kept calling you to attack him, to kill Ubaidullah. He says, we're from the family of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There is no treachery in our bloods. We don't stab anybody from the back. We don't hide. We don't trick even our enemies, no matter who they are. This was the nobility of Muslim al-Aqil. This was the position of Muslim ibn Aqil. And Imam al Hussein sends him to the people of Kufa. They receive him in the morning, warmly. And you all know that by evening, Muslim ibn Aqil was all by himself in the streets of Kufa. In the lonely, dark streets of Kufa, the Safir of Hussein, the cousin of Hussein, the beloved of Hussein. Allahu Akbar, the nephew of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He walked around in Kufa until he reached a home of an old woman. He stopped, he sat there. 
She came, she said to him, what do you need? Why are you sitting in front of my home? He says, I want some water, maybe something to drink. She gave him. Then she said to him, please leave my home. I'm a single woman. I don't want somebody to sit, to sit in front of my home. He said to her, Ya Amatullah, where should I go? She said to him, go to your family, go to your home. He said, but I don't have any family. I don't have a home. He says, who are you? Why are you gharib? He says, I wasn't supposed to be gharib. I was supposed to have a home. I am Muslim. Muslim ibn Aqil. Safir al Hussein. She says, Anta Muslim ibn Aqil? You're a Muslim? They've abandoned you in such a way? You represent Hussein, the son of Rasulullah? She opened her home. He went. Muslims spend the whole evening in dua, in prayer, in supplication, in Quran. And you all know the story how Muslims' life ended. They came into the home. Muslim fought and fought bravely. They captured him. They took him to the top of the mansion of Ibn Ziyad before they threw him off the mansion and dragged him in the streets of Kufa. Muslim said, Live, give me a, mo a moment to pray two rak'ah of salah. Two rak'ah. He prayed. And then he looked towards Imam al Hussein's camp. He glanced towards Imam al Hussein's camp. All of you with Muslim this evening, with Muslim ibn Aqil, the first martyr of Hussein, put your hands on your chests, give your salams. To your dear Imam, all of us together, wherever you may be, I can't hear you. I can't see you. But Imam Al Hussein can, and he will. Assalamu ala al Hussein. I know many people around the world have opened their homes to us. Because we're the messengers of Hussein. This is the least we can do to honor the messenger who was left in the streets. Many of you are sitting at home wearing black, sitting on the floor, looking at your TVs, doing the azadari of the son of Fatima. You've allowed us to come to your home. We thank you. But we don't want you to be silent as well. We want you to join us in this aza, whether you're at home, whether you're in your vehicles, wherever you may be, all together. We raise our voices with Muslim when he sent his salam to Imam Hussein. And that was the last salam, that was the last salutation of Muslim ibn Aqil to his Imam, Al Imam Al Hussein. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين 